Good evening and welcome to our forum for the Kansas City Council's 3rd, 5th, and 6th districts for the June 20th Kansas City Municipal Election. This forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Kansas City, Clay, Platt, and Jackson Counties, local Alpha Kappa Alpha Sororities Social Justice Committees, the Center for Neighborhood Leaders, and the South Kansas City Alliance. I am Anitra Steele, and I am a member of this league. The League of Women Voters is a trusted grassroots, nonpartisan organization whose members do the hands-on work to safeguard democracy. While we do not endorse candidate or oppose candidates or political parties, we are directly involved with the sharing of important issues. Our mission is to empower voters and to defend our democracy. We envision a democracy where every citizen has the knowledge, the right, the desire, and the confidence to participate. Our membership is open to everyone. I'd like you to know the other league members volunteering with me. Misty Jagger is our timekeeper, and our Zoom is being monitored by 50-year um, member Donna Howe. Hoke. I lead our forum's admin team. The public has sent in the questions via the league's website, lwvkc.org. Tonight, we are honored to have a guest moderator, Christelle Bell, WDAF Fox 4 News anchor. Welcome, Christelle, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Anitra. Good evening to you all, and thank you so much for being part of this forum tonight. Um, I look forward to uh, asking you some questions, and uh, thank you again for the opportunity to moderate tonight. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into it. You ready? All right, I will start off. Uh, we have districts three, five, and six, um, and I think we can probably go in that order. I'll just kind of randomly ask, uh, you to start it off, I'll kind of be um, just as fair as I can and who will start, who will begin, who will not, and that kind of thing. So um, let's get into it. First question coming from our public here. As a council member, what will be your priorities? And what is your background that prepares you for a complex and multi-million dollar budgeting process? So we'll go ahead and start with the third district. Uh, first, and uh, we'll start with uh, Sherry Hall. Sherry Hall. Good evening. Um, my name is Sherry Hall. I'm running for third district and district, and one of my main priorities is violence prevention. I am a mental health advocate, and I approach things through a lens of social determinants. So for me, what that looks like is that there is a decrease in violence where there is an increase in opportunity. I actually just even spoke about this yesterday regarding um, we have to be pro-living, not just anti-violence, but we have to actually be pro-living, which means doing the things that help us to um, succeed and move further in life and also enrich our communities. My experience is being on multiple um, councils and boards and also running a couple of nonprofits doing this kind of work. Um, and that is also my background within um, advocacy, activism, and community work. I am steadily watching this timer trying to make sure I don't go over because uh, there is so much that I could say about the things that I do in the community. Um, but the most important part is actually the community itself. Um, I believe in community organization and we don't do anything unless we do it together. And that is the main thing that I would like to leave us with in order to decrease violence, to increase opportunity and to make a change and to turn the tide on this thing. We absolutely must work together. And that's what I'm here for. Ms. Hall, thank you. Thank you for being on time. I appreciate it. Ms. Robinson, <laughs> we will come to you now. And if you need me to repeat the question, please just ask. No, not at all. Thank you so much. I am a huge fan of you, Ms. Bell. Thank you for all that you're doing in the city. 
um, and thank you for making Kansas City your home. Um, my name is Melissa thank Robinson. You. I am running for third district in district um, to be reelected. I've been serving for the past four years um, that I think does make me prepared to address uh, today's challenges with, that we are facing within the city of Kansas City. We built an opportunity agenda by listening to people. We do have a community brain trust and the community, those who live in the third district who are stakeholders in the third district came up with the seven point plan. And that seven point plan has to do with opportunity, making sure that people have access to land bank properties, for example, um, and, and ensuring that we build wealth off of those public assets, um, ensuring that our uh, financial institutions that are holding the city's dollars have strong community benefits agreements and really begin to monitor and, in and increase the amount of home ownership and amount of uh, loans that are being given for entrepreneurs um, through those banking systems that hold the taxpayer dollars. I don't have time to go through all seven points of that seven point plan, but I will tell you that I am, uh, I have an MBA. I've been on the council for four years. I served on the school board for five years. Under my leadership, the students tested higher than they ever have in the history of, of, of KCPS. And that's because we believe in key performance indicators and making sure that we're governing for success. And so those are some of the things that make me um, adequately prepared. I wanna go back to you, Ms. Robinson, because I wanna make sure it's clear. Are you saying the seven point plan, is that your priority or what would be your priority? Yes, the seven point plan are those priorities that have been set by residents um, and people who live in the third district. Okay, thank you for clearing that up. All right, let's move along now. I want to go to Ms. Park Shaw uh, with District 5. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. I am a current 5th District Councilwoman Raina Park Shaw running for re-election. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the League of Women Voters and, of course, uh, Alpha Cap Alpha Sorority, the local chapters, and all of the other partners for putting this together tonight. Uh, just uh, want, just uh, definitely want to... Uh, highlight the fact that uh, my priorities uh, will continue to be what I call the Five Alive uh, Plan, uh, which was established uh, in collaboration with the uh, Fifth District residents and neighborhoods. Five Alive standing for affordability, livability, infrastructure, violence prevention, and economic development. Uh, that has been the uh, primary area of focus in my first four years, and I will continue to focus on that as I think we have uh, still, while we've accomplished some great things, we have more work to be done. What qualifies me to continue to run for um, the fifth district council member is uh, just the experience that I've gained in the first four years. But in addition to that, um, I have a, a bachelor's in psychology, master's in uh, healthcare administration, have uh, actually, I'm a small business owner, have run uh, as a executive, a, a healthcare executive, have run uh, multi-million dollars of budgets and uh, have, have been very successful in my professional career. And I am looking forward to answering more of the questions tonight. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. All right, <clears throat> we'll move now to District 6. Um, Mr. Tarwater, let's start with you. Unmute for us. <laughs> that go. dog on mute button. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Found it. Thank you very much uh, to everybody tonight for uh, for your time and your dedication to the voters. Um, my my background is that I was a legislator for Jackson County for 28 years. Learned to work with a number of different people. We'll be able to work with the different uh, people on the city council really looking forward to it, uh, representing the sixth district in South Kansas City. And, you know, just like everyone else, I mean, what, what we're looking at today is what is crime prevent, prevention. Uh, there's a number of ways that we can do that. Uh, you know, we need to get to the root of the problem. We need to enforce the laws that are out there. And we need the city to work with the county, uh, with the detention facility, so that people can get the help that they need uh, you know, and sometimes go into timeout, uh, but behavior health and a drug, other things that we can help with. And then the homeless situation, we also need mental health in, in those areas, uh, which we have a strong problem all across the city, but in South Kansas City, we do also. And also uh, the streets and sidewalks. 
Uh, Red Bridge Road has been torn up for about a year and a half, two years actually, uh, and sidewalks in, in a number of neighborhoods need to be repaired. And I want to bring some of that back to the sixth district. So I'm looking forward to serving with others on the city council. All right, thank you. Mr. Duncan, last but not least, go ahead. Hey, thank you, Ms. Bell. Thank you, League of Women Voters, for having me this evening. My name is Jonathan Duncan. I'm running to represent Kansas City in the 6th N District. Um, I'm an Army combat veteran with 10 years of service and a tour in Iraq. Um, I'm a community organizer with KC Tenants, and that leads exactly into you know where my where my first three priorities are. Um, to be sure, uh, the uh, the people's platform, which is which I've adopted, uh, was sourced through 600 community members, um, and I'm just going to touch on three points of that. Uh, truly affordable housing um, is is a priority number one. Uh, we can't accomplish much else if we don't have homes. Um, and truly affordable housing to me is housing that we can actually afford that's based on the lived experience of our residents, which actually equates to about $500 for a one bedroom. Uh, we worked, uh, Casey Tenants worked to pass the $50 million bond initiative uh, to that is designed to create truly affordable housing. And I just, I was running a little bit late uh, because I was at the, uh, the, the housing trust fund um, town hall this evening. Um, True public safety, and by that I mean actually addressing the root causes of crime, and that means housing first, that means increased access to mental health care services, that means uh, better public transit to allow people to access good, thriving wages, jobs, um, and real community engagement. Um, so as I said before, I'm a community or organizer, and we say in community organizing that the people closest to the problems are closer to the solutions, um, our government should work the same way. Uh, so actually co-governing with the people uh, and the residents of Kansas City to craft policy, solu policy solutions that affect their lives. I believe that, oh, and I'm over time, I'm so sorry. Um, Jonathan Duncan running in 6th N District, thank you. I will ask you this, can you go into and give about 30 seconds, just kind of talk a little bit more about what you mean specifically when you talk about co-governing? Yes, thank you. Um, so as I said before, that I'm a true believer that that you know what you need more on your block um, than the 26th floor of City Hall. Um, I, I'm looking forward to actually meeting people where they are. Um, so when we're crafting policy solutions um, that affect the 6th District, uh, we're actually going to need to um, look to do more than just provide a committee meeting in the middle of the day. So um, being able to take com uh, community comment via email, um, utilizing Zoom calls, um, as well as um, surveys to actually get community input and, uh, and cultivate that group genius that lives in our city, but so often people don't have access to. All right, thank you so much for explaining that. Um, so we'll move into question number two. I think we heard Mr. Tarwater mention this as well. Um, what would be your priority and first steps as a council member to end homelessness in Kansas City? We've seen several plans um, throughout the last couple of years to end homelessness. Um, some initiatives, new initiative has came out. Let's talk about it. What would be your priority? And we'll start with the fifth district, the fifth district, uh, Ms. Parks Shaw. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, definitely a, an area that I'm very familiar with, uh, having served as the chair of the mayor's uh, houseless task force. Um, which in which the two years you talked about the strategies that have, have been established. Um, I worked intimately uh, in leading the task force to uh, do a community needs assessment based upon our homelessness uh, issues, those individuals who are experiencing houselessness currently. Uh, we then established the zero KC plan, uh, which is a five year plan to get us to what they call functional zero. Uh, the plan is available on kcmo.gov, so anyone who has questions can check it out there. What I will do over the next uh, four years and the next term is to work to, co to continue to identify funding for that program and to work to implement the action steps that were established and working regionally to address our issues with houselessness here in Kansas City. Definitely that includes creating uh, affordable housing, uh, creating transitional low barrier shelter for those individuals who are experiencing houselessness, but also working to prevent homelessness, prevent them from even becoming houseless in the first place. Uh, as we, we recognize that uh, that strategy will allow us to utilize less funds uh, and be more effective in that. So those are the areas that I will continue to prior prioritize in the next term. Thank you. 
So what would be the first, the actual first steps of that plan then? The actual first step of the plan is to establish low barrier shelter. Uh, well, actually the first step was to hire staff. We've done that. So we mm -hmm. uh, actually with council support um, hired now three uh, individuals who will be working on houselessness. And so those, all three of those individuals now are on board and we will now then work to establish low barrier shelter uh, for those individuals uh, who need transitional housing um, to get them right off the street. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, let's go to Ms. Robinson. Um, thank you. Um, transitional living is so very important. And I do want to say that the city does have um, assets that is disposable through its homesteading authority, through its um, land bank properties to address um, housing immediately. So the first thing I would do was to work with the council colleagues to move out of um, a committee that's been sitting in committee for several um months now, and that is to utilize funding to um, address blighted properties right now to turn them into uh, transitional living um, shelters and low barrier shelters for people who are houseless. I think the worst thing that we can continue to do is to have these assets and not utilize them accordingly. Um, I was just uh, named on the house, the homesteading authority. Um, and so we look forward to, to utilizing uh, that position to further um, this work. Um, the issue with houselessness really does have to do with making sure that people have the resources needed to, um, to purchase attainable housing, right? And so we need specific things that we can do to make sure that people have the jobs and people have the wages that they need, as well as addressing the housing stock. Um, there's also a $2 million uh, fund to work with investing in um, housing now for people who um, are immediately homeless and we'll be work uh, my time is running out so I can't go into more detail but we'll be working to make sure that we um, get those resources and revenue to make sure that we can work with um, landlords and we can look at things like the city investing in um, social housing. Social housing is something that is a dirty word, but it's actually the city investing, just as we invest in luxury housing, investing in people's housing. And so we have to take a strong look at that okay. and make sure that we are utilizing uh, those things, as, as well as a lot of other things. But hats off to um, Councilwoman Raina okay. Park off for doing a lot of the work. I'm, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. I was like, you can finish the thought. Okay. 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 <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> Let's go now to Mr. Duncan. Yes, the first steps, right, is housing first, right? We, we can't begin to address the underlying causes of houselessness if we don't, if we don't get people off the street. So uh, much like uh, Councilwoman Raina Park Shaw stated, um, you know, getting that transitional housing, that, that low access, um, immediate housing to get people off uh, the street, so then we can provide those wraparound services. I think is is absolutely it, it, the first the first step. Um, the second step um, is is moving them into transitional housing, um, addressing those underlying causes of houselessness, um, whether that be mental health access. Um, uh, I, it it's something that's near and dear to me. Uh, without access to free um, VA provided uh, mental health care, I wouldn't be here. Uh, so, you know, addressing that um, and then broadening the access to, to mental health care, I, th I think is absolutely imperative. Um, and then, as I said before, right, um, co-governance. Um, so actually working with houseless folks uh, to talk with them about what their barriers are. Um, I don't think that, you know, we can create solutions um, for people. I don't think our government should, should be doing things to people. I think we should be working with um, those people who are closer to the problem um, so that we can craft policy solutions that actually work for them. Uh, Mr. Tarwater. Yes, um, it's a very complex problem and there's uh, you know a lot of that population that is out on the street right now that we're not gonna be able to help. That's not a popular thing to say. Uh, you know, directly with putting them anywhere. You cannot put people into, uh, you know, into a hotel and expect them to get better. We need to provide services for these kind of things. So if we're going to put people up in a hotel or buy it with the city funds, then we need to make sure that we have the mental health needs and the, you know, make sure that they're taking their medication or if they're self-medicating to help them get off of those kind of things. 
then we can start to address where where they can live and where they can move to. So the biggest thing would be like what we did in Jackson County, we spent about $6 million and we actually prevented people from getting homeless or houseless. So what we did is we got them current on their bills, the utilities, and caught up on rent so they could get their heads above water and then go forward and, and, and help themselves into the future. So to prevent houselessness, you keep them in the home that they're in. The ones that are out on the street, I have gone around and I have talked to them and I have tried to work with them and I've tried to get them to shelters. Uh, right now, a lot of them, especially with the weather the way it is, they don't want to go anywhere. So over time, we can work on that, but it's through mental health challenges and all of us working together to get that done. All right, thank you. Last but not least, Ms. Hall. So as far as the homeless issue um, goes, I do agree with all the candidates with a housing first approach, but I believe that approach does have to be combined with resource navigation. Um, not, not only that, but also how do we source all of this? Every quote unquote homeless person is not underneath a bridge or in a shelter. Um, a lot of times when we look at homelessness, we're looking at the HUD definition of homelessness rather than what it actually is. And when people are looking at the HUD definition, we're only looking at tier one rather than all four tiers, which would also include people sleeping on someone's couch who, if they got mad at them and we're being honest about it, cussed them out and kicked them out, now they're homeless. Um, we have to look at all four of those tiers. Um, some of those people are actually accounted for on our um, list of people who are on the waiting list for public housing and on the waiting list for Section 8. Um, those two lists alone encompass like 29,000 people. Um, being able to help those people provide resource navigation and resources, um, even while we still yet have a way to capture them, um, is really crucial um, because you can't help populations you cannot find or identify. Um, I myself actually am already working on some information to provide treatment for people um, experiencing homelessness to pull together resource navigation. And there's also very many, um, brain just went blank, lots of organizations that are currently working on the issue but do not work together. So one of my first moves would be to have those organizations start working together and then pairing them with people who we can identify um, even outside of those HUD definitions. Do you have a specific plan or a specific action on how you would be able to identify those people on those different tiers that you mentioned and identifying how they, how you would be able to connect them? Because as you mentioned, someone may be on somebody's couch, but they not necessarily have a way for you to contact them. So do you have any type of plan on how you would be able to, you know, really truly reach people who are houseless in all of those different tiers? So one of those things, um, again, I am a mental health advocate, and just like um, Jonathan Duncan said, talking about co-governance, I talk it, call it lived experience, where we have people sitting at the table who can help us come up with those mechanisms to identify people. Some of those people, again, are in our resource data banks already who have applied for public housing, Section 8, and things of that nature. Um, we can also come up with a referral and reporting system. Um, but then to everybody does not necessarily want to be in a house. So creating some form of public enclave for those people also who maybe they do want to live off the grid. You just can't live off the grid on the grid. All right. Thank you, Ms. Hall. All right. I think y'all warmed up a little bit. Let's get into it a little bit more. Uh, let's talk about what we just saw a couple of weeks ago, more than a couple of weeks ago, last month. Um, Please, we saw the NFL draft weekend come to Kansas City this year. Um, so please discuss the positives and the shortcomings of the NFL draft weekend. Um, what are some lessons that were learned for our participation for 2026 when the World Cup comes to Kansas City? Um, and more specifically, um, I know that there were a lot of issues with small businesses saying they did not um, generate the revenue that they expected from the World Cup. So if you would maybe address that as well. I'm sorry, with the draft, not the World Cup. But yes, I'm jumping ahead. I'm ready for it. <laughs> um, let's see, we will start now 
with uh, Ms. Robinson. Let's start with you this time. Sure. Um, one of the things with the NFL is just really managing expectations. Uh, we work really hard to make sure that there was a business inclusive program that the NFL has already um, had stood up. And so really working to make sure that we work with our businesses so that they understand what the obligations that the city has in hosting um, some of these large events. Um, but also there are ways that the city can invest in uh, marketing and making sure that we're elevating and amplifying our small businesses and, and way making. Uh, one of the things that we did with the draft was we um, had transit going east and west of the location to make sure that individuals got a chance to experience those neighborhoods, got a chance to experience um, those um, actual businesses that were there. We need to do more of that uh, when we think about coming up for the uh, World Cup. And we need to make sure that we have uh, businesses that are serving on committees that are really talking about, you know, what does it take? What do they need to make sure that they're able to be included in these conversations um, and developing a plan alongside them so that we can meet those expectations? Um, we did what we were supposed to do with the NFL draft in terms of meeting those contractual obligations to the NFL. Um, however, when you have businesses that feel like that they were left out, um, there are, there's a lot of room for improvement that that can only start with working with the businesses directly. Mr. Tarwater? Well, I agree with that of setting the expectations. Um, the, the NFL draft was a wonderful experience <laughs> for Kansas City it, itself. Uh, talked to a number of people from out of town that were at the draft and they loved Kansas City. They thought it was a beautiful place. They loved the city, they loved the people. Everyone was so nice. So we, as a city, showed very well to the rest of not only the United States, but to the world. Uh, and so we pulled it off. And, that, and I gotta give congratulations to the city for making it safe. The transportation uh, you know, was very good for something like this, but could it have been better? Yes, I love the east-west routes. I love the school buses. I love being able to get people around, but also we kind of had congestion in different areas. So we did block some of the small businesses. I do know that the Kansas City Sports Commission had worked with some of the small businesses to get them included because the difference between the NFL and the soccer is the NFL controls, tries to control everything. So they, everything was on property uh, and they set up vendors of the 26 vendors that were selected through the sports commission, uh, you know, through uh, so that they could sell in those areas. And the NFL tries to keep everything right there. With the World Cup, it's gonna be across all of Kansas City. So all of Kansas City can be lifted with this. And even though some of those small businesses might have not experienced the business they thought they would get, that what, they, what we got was exposure and future business coming here to Kansas City because it's such a wonderful town. So we did a great job. All right, thank you. Ms. Hall. Aha. Uh -huh. So with regards to the um, NFL draft, I think the city in and of itself did a good job for something that huge coming here and that was huge for us. Um, one of the things that I would address with regards to our basic city services and just even elections, um, we had lots of people who were complaining that they could not get down um, to the election bureau, that they couldn't get around, that they couldn't get to polls, that they were having issues um, getting around. And this is before the draft happened, but it was all the construction and preparation before the draft. Um, so looking at timing that this um, World Cup is going to be here for a more elongated period of time um, during the summer, I'm not sure what exact elections are going to go on at, at that point, but it causes concern for me um, with regards to what we might be blocking for our citizens who are here. So we need to pay more careful attention to that. And as well, um, I am for funding and really um, giving an injection into to our small businesses here and making sure that they are highlighted at all times. Um, Mr. Duncan. 
Yeah, I mean, things that went well is that Kansas City got highlighted. Um, and I think, you know, being on the world stage is something to be proud of. Um, again, we always have to ask, you know, who who is benefiting, though? And I think, you know, as, um, you know, previously was stated by Councilwoman Robinson and others, um, is that we need to work with our small businesses because I talked to a lot of them. They said I, they staffed up, they stocked up, um, and then and then no business came. Right. So I would like to see, as uh, Ms. Hall stated, you know, um, I know that the supposedly the I don't, and I haven't seen the final numbers, but I know that supposedly uh, the, the city got a lot of revenue from the NFL draft. I'd like to see us um, bolster some of our small businesses who happen to be uh, our largest employer um, in Kansas City. Uh, receive some of those revenues that they lost out on um, if there's a way to do that. Additionally, when you think about um, the the difference between the NFL draft and the World Cup um, is is how expansive the World Cup is going to be. And so although the, the public transit seemed to be very good uh, when it came to the NFL draft, um, we need to create public transit that works now. And by that, I mean, we need to heavily invest in our public transit um, for the residents who live here today so that the, the visitors who are coming from all over the world can just simply fold into the public transit that's already working instead of us trying to create one-off solutions um, to, to, address, to address all these influx of visitors um, because how are they gonna get around our city? Um, the, the, the one thing I do wanna point out that I don't think many people um, know is that the stage for the NFL draft was not built by union labor. And I think that's an issue. We have to ensure that um, the, the workers that are, that are building and that are, are working these events um, um, have thriving wages um, and have work protection. So um, uh, ran out of time, but uh, yeah. I, would, I would end there. All righty. Thank you. Um, Ms. Parkshaw, I saw that there was a little bit of you wanting to address something Mr. Duncan said. No, I was just getting ready. That's all. <laughs> okay. All right. Go ahead. Uh, but I wasn't sure if you were going to have a follow up with them, but I was just trying to make sure that you weren't waiting on me. Um, but I uh, definitely, as a small business owner, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of my priorities is making sure that we can um, really create uh, synergies and create and really change the way that the Kansas that Kansas City looks at our small businesses. I would love to see us look at at the uh, support and investment as that investment, uh, which is um, I know that many small businesses were uh, frustrated by um, the what happened with the draft. While I think overall it was a successful event, I think that the city could have done a better job of making sure that all of our businesses, our small businesses especially, had an opportunity to capture some of the revenues that came through this town, which is why um, I sponsored legislation after that, after the draft, to establish a small business task force to advise the mayor and council on uh, strategies and opportunities that we can employ right now and moving forward. Um, I think it's been said, I think we have an opportunity now, not just for when the World Cup comes in 2026, but today, um, as we are building out, as, as we are doing all the infrastructure changes and those things, we can make sure that the small businesses have an opportunity to engage in that. Uh, which is why I think uh, the work that the, the health department is doing to train small businesses and nonprofit organizations on how to apply for grants, apply for dollars with the city, I think is huge and why I am a supporter of that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a big question plaguing a lot of people right now and even today. We heard, um, our, we heard Mayor Lucas, we heard Stacey Graves, we heard from uh, city officials addressing the Memorial Day weekend uh, shooting shootings. So let's talk about crime. Let's talk about gun violence in our city. And just, just today, uh, five o'clock, three people were shot, um, injured. So let's talk about this. Um, the question is, uh, 2023 is turning out to be another record setting year for gun deaths in Kansas City. So what new efforts need to be made to reduce murders and other major crimes? And for that one, we'll start with you, Mr. Tarwater. Okay. Um, it is a terrible situation that we're living through right now. We have kind of gotten away from enforcing some of the laws. Um, it, you know, it, it's it's against the law to own a gun if you're a felon. But there's a lot of that happening. Um, it is, 
you know, we've, we've got all the mental health issues out there. We, we need to reach people. We need to get to the root of those causes, yes. But I'm a believer in we, we, need, to, we need to actually, the laws that we have on the books, we need, to start, we need to start using them. We need to start prosecuting them. And I'm not for putting everybody in a box, you know, in a jail. But let's start, you know, like right now you have people just going in stores, taking things, and then you've got people stealing cars. And then they keep graduating up. You rob a convenience store with a gun. You're out the next morning if you didn't use the gun. And then all of a sudden, uh, you rob another convenience store and you use a gun. Um, if we can put a pause in there somewhere, whether it's just you know to hold them for five days for an evaluation, at least it's a consequence of them doing things. Right now, I know the police. You know, will arrest people and then they just tend to be out and then the courts are backed up, everything else is backed up. Uh, and to the criminal element, it's like there's no consequence and they keep going and it keeps getting elevated. We need to work on the violence prevention uh, solutions. We need to work on you know, like a NOVA kind of thing, the, uh, the new uh, Kansas City 360. So I'm in favor of that, of that working with the public. I heard what you're saying. I heard we need to work on these, but my, I think my question is, is there anything specific that you're saying? Does this start with the police department? Does this start with the judicial system, the court system? Does this start with a hospital? Like anything, a specific plan or anything that you feel that needs to be targeted first to kind of help with this? I know that you listed a lot of the problems, mm -hmm. um, but just any solutions directly. The, solu the solution would be uh, the police department is 430 officers short. We need to get their 430 officers. We need to get the jail built because right now the Kansas City doesn't have anywhere to hold anybody, you know, even for you know, even for a couple of days. So those things need to happen. Then the consequences happen. Then we can move forward. All right. Thank you. All right, Miss Hall. Let's go to you. With regards to our violence problem, um, I think I've said it before, I'll say it again, that I am pro-living. Um, pro-living is a lot different than anti-violence. Um, I've always been pro-living. If we have a um, pro-choice or pro-life argument, I'm going to say I'm pro-living. Same thing with violence and anti-violence. Number one, um, gun violence is violence, just like domestic violence is violence. Violence is violence. Um, and violence begets violence. So once we start dealing with our mindset around violence and also not just dealing with people who have um, passed on, but also dealing with people who have survived and helping them to live again, um, we'll start seeing some decrease in the violence, not just even um, giving opportunities and new programs, but honestly changing the mindset of our community in here. We, we are riddled with trauma. We have people with survivor's guilt. We have people who do not know situation handling. There's no emotional intelligence. So the first thing we do is go to pick up a firearm or to strike back or you hit my cousin, so now I'm gonna hit you. Um, it's all very reactionary. And while I do agree that the, the police department is short, we still have this issue where people don't wanna be police officers. Um, until we start to change the face even of law enforcement, we are not going to see a change there either. So for me, a solution, to finish that thought, for me, a solution um, or even a beginning to the solution of, of ending our violence problem is actually dealing with the community trauma and dealing with our community mindset. Um, because we can't enforce laws with people who don't even want to self-govern. All right. Ms. Parkshaw. Yes, uh, so, you know, I, I think in the last form, I talked about uh, the work that uh, my colleagues and I, uh, Councilman Robinson co-sponsored as well, uh, the 30 million for violence prevention to fund the blueprint for violence prevention, which uh, was established uh, over three years by uh, over 60 organizations and 100 community stakeholders. And so definitely continuing to fund that, to fund those programs, looking at uh, the root causes of why 
uh, violence is committed in the first place. But there's a new concept uh, just in the work that I've been doing with uh, Partners for Peace, uh, which is a Department of Justice initiative that the city is, is working on. In addition to my work on the uh, KC360, which uh, is a model that is patterned after the success that Omaha had. Um, one of the other uh, pieces that I think is important is called DICE. It's data-informed community engagement, where you um, it it's doesn't the primary focus is not on law enforcement, but it's data-informed information that engages the community to look at things like what they call risk-terrain modeling. They look at why does crime occur in the area? Why is the opportunity presented to for the crime to occur in those areas? So from the city's perspective, working on the, reducing the blight, working on the land bank properties as Councilman Robinson already talked about, working on uh, ensuring that we have lighting, proper lighting and all of those things that will actually help to reduce the opportunity in addition to strengthening, giving them resources, giving the community the resources that they need so that they don't get involved into the life of crime uh, as well. And I'll, I'll pause there just because I'm out of time, but I think this is a, a model that has been shown to be successful in other communities. All right, thank you, Mr. Duncan. And then we'll end with you, Ms. Robinson. Yeah, uh, first and foremost, I want to address a couple of things Mr. Tarwater said. We do enforce the laws. And in fact, we enforce the laws um, on black and brown folks um, seemingly more than we do other folks. Um, and so when we talk about over policing um, our communities, I, I disagree with that. Um, we're not going to be able to jail ourselves to safer streets, first and foremost. Um, I think, you know, we need to ensure that we are looking, um, as Ms. Uh, Councilwoman Randall Park Shaw said, um, addressing the root causes um, of crime, uh, addressing the, the root causes of violent crime, um, you know, violence intervention, uh, um, I think is absolutely important. Um, as as Ms. Hall said, um, expanding the emotional intelligence and addressing um, the, uh, you know, addressing, excuse me, addressing the uh, the root causes of, of uh, these disagreements um, and, and looking for advocates um, to, to intervene, um, community leaders to intervene um, in these disputes. Because so often I think I, I, the statistic is uh, about 90% um, of these gun violence um, are with people who know each other. Um, I think that uh, I'm, I, I wanna see more less guns on the street. Uh, I, I want to see um, us, you know, maybe look to some buyback pro programs, um, ways that we can start getting these guns off the street. Um, I think that, again, when we look at our laws, uh, they are being enforced. Um, and I have to ask the question of why Mr. Tarwater decided um, to, to not enforce federal gun laws while in the county. Um, you know, the, 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 the uh, Second Amendment Preservation Act that uh, uh, the, the state passed, the county had an opportunity uh, to fight against that and uh, tar, water, tar water ensured that it, that it didn't happen. So um, I think that we need to be uh, electing folks who want to get guns off the street, um, who want to enforce um, laws that get guns off the street, and that um, I think in order to do that, we need, we need people who are focused um, on those initiatives. Okay. Mr. Tarwater, I'll give you a second to rebuttal that if you want to address that, but I want to give everybody an opportunity, the same platform to speak. So Ms. Robinson, I'll come to you. And then if Mr. Tarwater wants to address that, he can go. Thank you. So in the third district where a lot of the crime and violence is occurring, when you go into the store, the baby formula is locked up. People can't afford baby formula. And so what we're dealing with as it relates to crime and violence, it is because of the desperation of individuals not having their basic necessities being met. And the city has a direct opportunity to address a lot of these things. And our opportunity agenda does do some of those as it relates to making sure that in these communities, we have not passed a, a levy to increase funding for our schools in 50 years. Yet the city continues to give tax breaks for luxury housing, luxury development, while we take money away from children. There is no, you cannot, there is unequivocal evidence that says that if you do not graduate from high school, the chances of you becoming a perpetrator or a victim of violence is extremely high. And so why, and, and then on top of that, the evidence around African-American males, by, by, by which I do have two of them myself, are the number one group 
that is experiencing violence and crime? What are we doing to invest in African-American males in the city? What are we doing to make sure that we're utilizing the public purse to ensure that they have access to jobs, access to transportation, that they have what they need in order to be successful? There is no mystery as to why we are in this situation. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Mr. Tarwater, did you want to address that? Sure. Um, 30 seconds, yeah. Yeah, I, I'll address it real quick. Uh, when the county, it was a, a state law that the state had done, we were working with state officials and it was something that the executive put up that was not gonna do anything other than uh, make the state mad and retaliate against us. I am 100% opposed to having this many guns out on the street with people that have no idea how to use them and they're only using them in angry, violent ways. So yes, I, I want to address it also by having uh, shop class in school and, and people going to the trades because college isn't for everyone. And there's a, over 100,000 jobs out there that are well-paying jobs that I would love to get people interested in. Thank you so much. I think we could do a forum on this topic Mm -hmm. by itself. Um, and I wanted to ask enough, some more questions, but I want to get to these other, other questions before. So we'll move on. I um, want to talk about this uh, issue now as we move into this as far as landfills. As a city with half a million residents right now, we generate a lot of trash. Yet no one wants a landfill near their home, right? Will you commit to voting against any possible landfill developments and against any zoning changes to allow for landfill development within the city limits. And um, I'm trying to give everybody an opportunity to start off. So Ms. Parkshaw, I think you haven't had a chance to start. You can go first. Okay, uh, yes. So definitely um, I have um, already uh, stated my position that uh, you know the fifth district has a, a closed landfill in it already. We don't need another one, don't want another one. Uh, I think the residents have been pretty clear about that uh, as the fifth district is expanding into this new area. But I think what, what I would uh, really like to push for and see the city do, uh, because at, with half a million residents, we have to reduce our waste, uh, which I think the, you know, sponsoring as a sponsor of um, a co-sponsor, which Councilman Robinson led that initiative to get recycle carts citywide is, is one major step that we are taking to reduce our waste. But I think we also need to be, look more aggressively at how we can continue to work to reduce the waste, not just Kansas City. I would love to see our neighboring cities also join in across the region to try to reduce uh, the trash that we are putting into landfills. Otherwise, we will need one. Uh, you know, unless we we do something drastic, we will need one. And so, I would love to see our our neighboring cities join in and and uh, start to do recycle carts in the way that Kansas City has done. But definitely, the answer to the question is yes. Uh, I will uh, vote not to support any zoning changes uh, to add another landfill here in Kansas City, but we've got to take it a step further than that. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Duncan? Yes, I would vote no uh, for another landfill. And I, I want to, I just want to give a shout out to the organizers um, uh, behind Stop the Landfill because it has been incredible. You all have been tenacious. You've been showing up to every single meeting um, and that's what community organizing looks like. Um, and I think the reason when we look at why there's such a vehement response um, to a new landfill is because uh, the proposed landfill uh, in the community uh, didn't have community buy-in. Right. So it, it didn't have community buy in the, the the residents didn't know they found out um, through uh, through other ways when they were trying to sell their homes uh, and they were upset and rightfully so. Um, so uh, the first the answer to the question is, yes, I would oppose a landfill. Um, but to uh, Councilwoman uh, Raina Park Shaw's um, uh, statements, uh, we need to reduce our waste. Um, and every sign looks like uh, that we are going to be moving to a position where eventually we are going to need a new landfill. Um, and but in, to reduce the waste first, uh, I would definitely support um, a citywide compost initiative, um, uh, uh, expanded recycling efforts. Um, and when it's not going to be an if, but when um, a new landfill um, does does come down the pike, 
that we're going to have to work with our community members, um, not just here in Kansas City, but in the surrounding areas to decide exactly what it's going to look like, what its impact is going to be, um, and, and ensuring that the people uh, who will be affected by it um, have a, ha absolutely have a say um, in how it's created. All right, Ms. Ms. Hall. Um, I think the only answer to this question is yes. I don't know that um, a whole lot of fluff or, or talk around that subject is even necessary, just yes. Um, would I want a landfill in my backyard? Absolutely not. Why would I support a landfill in someone else's backyard? But we do have to pull together a regional effort to figure out this issue where it is not affecting people. Um, because if we're quite honest, there's very many parts of our city, even inside of the third district, where there is toxicity underneath and in our ground. And we go back to that violence question, why is violence occurring at such a high rate? Um, there are studies that show that even the toxicity and environmental factors can affect the way that people's brains and reasoning functions. Um, so if we're trying to actively decrease violence and make the city greener, but then we're talking about putting another landfill somewhere right by where people are, I think we are being counterintuitive. So we have to continue to um, think about all parts of the equation. And that is one that definitely affects absolutely everything that we're trying to decrease. All right, Ms. Robinson and last, we'll go to Mr. Tarwater. Tarwater, I'm sorry. Well, it does take 15 years to be able to begin to do site preparation for a landfill and our landfill is losing its life cycle. When we tried to reduce waste, um, uh, when we implemented the two bag limit, the third district became the landfill. Uh, you cannot go down many streets um, in the third district where you're not seeing large amounts of trash, litter and debris. Um, and so that's why I led an effort to make sure that we had one trash carts and two recycle containers um, so that people could properly dispose of their waste. Um, what I will commit to is making sure that any municipality within a mile of any of these discussions has to have buy-in. And then we also, as it's been stated, I will amplify what's already been said. This has to be a regional effort. This is not only Kansas City's trash. This is trash across the region, and we all have to be able to address how we're going to take care of this issue. It's not just a Kansas City problem. Um, so I've already reached out to the feds, to Mid-America Regional uh, Council, to our state. Let's start to have to take on leadership so that we can do all of what my colleagues on this call have said as relates to reducing waste, but also looking to the future to figure out how do we address the uh, mass amount of trash that's happening specifically in the third district and making sure we're prepared for the future. Thank you, Mr. Tarwater. Yes, and we do have, we have issues across all of Kansas City. So I would be committed to saying no to the new landfill and especially out where they were gonna put it because it was gonna contaminate a stream, uh, you know, go into a couple of the lakes out there. The community had no idea. And really the city council didn't really know anything about it either. It just kind of all happened behind a closed door. So nothing should happen behind a closed door. We need transparency. At some point in the future, yes, I agree with Melissa. We we definitely are going to need a landfill, but it needs to be the regional approach so that we bring in the other cities also and we come up with a plan. But you know, in the sixth district, we do a lot of recycling, but we need to make sure we do that across all of Kansas City. And I, I'm excited for the new containers. We're going to uh, you know, help people, teach people how they can recycle better. And then we also need to make sure that we do a good job with these transfer stations uh, because that's a source of, the, of a lot of the waste that's going out there. We saw it on TV, you know, where it's going out of uh, different uh, transfer trucks. And, you know, those trucks, the trucking companies need to be fined if they don't have those things parked correctly. But I watch it out my window coming across 470 in my office, and I see it all blowing out of these trucks and, and then getting stuck in the fences. So we need to make sure that the transfer stations are clean too. So a regional approach and recycling. All right, thank you. Um, next question, Kansas City needs a new jail. I think this kind of question goes or coincides with when we talk about violence 
and crime in our city, but Kansas City needs a new jail. What options do you offer? And um, we can start, oh, Ms. Robinson had to step away. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was about to say, we can start with you on this one. Um, thank you so very much. Um, I think we have to be very explicit about the number of beds that's necessary. Um, I'm going to use my colleague's words who said this in committee, so forgive me, Raina Parkshaw, but I 100% believe that what we're doing currently is uh, inhumane as it relates to the amounts of length that people have to travel in order to get to our current um, situation, our, our current um, setup with uh, the jail system. I also do believe that we need to look at alternatives. Um, the municipal uh, jail should not be in the business of just locking people up. We need to be making sure that uh, mental health issues are being taken care of. And then when we talk about crimes of opportunity, the root cause of that is um, access to living wage employment. Um, and so I am wanting to make sure that if we, if and when we do build a facility, that we're looking at more beds for mental health services, for detox, and making sure that we have ladders to opportunity for people. And then we're looking at alternatives to uh, jails because we cannot get in a situation where we overbuild a jail and then we're looking for people to just um, house the jail. Um, and so um, I won't over talk that, but um, yes, we do need a facility. Uh, but we do need to make sure that we're looking at how do we decrease the amount of people that are in that facility and not just overbuild. We'll say within the third district, Ms. Hall. Absolutely. Um, I am a proponent of decarcerating KC. We, there are, our city is my God. Um, so me dealing with people with regards to the system and even as they get probation, parole, things like that, um, looking at even our probation department and those programs, they are overworked and understaffed. So even as we're looking for um, other diversionary problems, probation, trying to get people out of incarceration, um, we still have very few resources even there. Um, this is yet another area where resource navigators and um, caseworkers could come into play. Uh, for your low-level offenses, your nonviolent offenses, your offenses that um, are not necessarily putting lives in danger, we have to begin to work to not lock these people up, period. We can't do business as usual. We continue to talk this business as usual. And then we talk it every four years at election time, I'm just saying. Um, and the business as usual, usual is more cops lock more people up. And we've been doing this cycle going this whole time. And now we need a new facility. Um, I will agree with Melissa here that it's inhumane. I have been there to visit people. I have gone into um, the prison system and the jail system to provide services, workshops, and things of that nature. And it is completely inhumane to continue to go the way that we're going. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Parkshaw, District 5. Thank you. Uh, definitely, I am in agreement with what has been said. I think we need to ensure that we address the root causes um, of why individuals are committing the crimes, what, what forces them to do that in the first place. Uh, when, I, when I talk with the judges and they tell me that we have our, some unhoused individuals who will continue to commit crimes over and over until they reach a level of a crime that will allow them to stay overnight in jail, we got a problem that we need to address. And so being able to handle the, the issues that our unhoused individuals experience, the mental illness, the mental health illness, the illnesses that also uh, make up uh, the individuals that are going to our municipal system. Definitely uh, the fact that they are riding 90, 90 minutes away because we don't have a jail here in Kansas City is absurd. And so I agree uh, with what has been said that's inhumane and we need to address that. I do, however, because so I believe that we need to look at alternatives to jail, but I know that there are some individuals who will need to be jailed. So I think controlling, looking at the number of beds so we're not um, over, um, so, so we're not have, so we don't have too many beds. I think we need to do a, a significant study to ensure that we are addressing the mental health is issues 
uh, and the root causes, uh, as well as being able to uh, look at uh, the reentry programs, which the $30 million for violence prevention actually is will focus some of its attention and dollars on um, reducing reentry of recidivism as well. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Tarwater. Yes, um, I do know that the city definitely does need a jail, but the city doesn't need a jail on their own. The city needs to be working with the county. The county's jail is inhumane. There's been three separate studies along with uh, federal uh, people that have come in and say it's inhumane. So that thing needs to go away. And that's why they're committed to building a new facility. And at that new facility are all the wraparound services and it is justice with dignity so that you make sure that the mental health beds are increased by five times, you know, and, and, and you're going to have that there. But you also have the other programs for reentry, whether it be fathering job, uh, job core, um, you know, and, and some other services that are going to be, you know, help with training uh, so that people can get back on that right path. And the city can do that. And at the last time I looked, it was seven and a half million dollars per 64 beds. The city was looking at 200 beds, so that'd be about 21.5 million. Then they would pay for some of the wraparound services. Excuse and me. with that, they'd still say the taxpayers would save over a hundred million dollars. Then we also need to expand the you know low-level crime. You know, the people that are in the Jackson County Jail right now are murder, rape, uh, and you know, child molestation are the people that are, are in there. The hardest job at the county is the judge that has to let someone out when someone gets picked up for murder and they have to let someone else out. So the, uh, the size I believe is now a thousand. The study said 2,500, that's too big. I agree with everyone else. So a thousand can be, can be done for the most violent. And then we need to do the uh, monitoring and other services that we have started to do in the past. And I would love to expand that. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Yeah, I largely agree with, um, you know, Ms. Hall, Councilwoman Park Shaw and Councilwoman Robinson. Uh, we need to address the root causes of crime to reduce um, our need for jails, uh, period. Uh, the, le the leading cause of crime is poverty. Uh, so we need to address, um, you know, affordable housing, good paying jobs, transit to get to those jobs, um, and mental health care access. Um, I think that we need to be focusing our efforts um, on having intentional investment um, to, address, to address the needs of our city, uh, to reduce our needs for a jail. Um, I agree that uh, with, with most, most folks here that um, from everything that I've heard, I haven't been in that jail, but I, I've heard it's awful. Um, I, I think most jails are awful. Um, I think the United States jails more people anywhere else in the world, um, and we still have crime. Um, so I think that we need more community investment um, to, to reduce our reliance on jails. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a few more questions. I know that we've reached over the hour mark. Um, so we can get to these last couple of questions as quickly as possible. Um, what do you see as the cause of the low voter turnout in municipal elections and what can be done to change that? And um, I think I'll start with um, Mr. Tarwater this time. Uh, I think timing is one of them. Uh, you know, we, our, our election that's coming up is on June 20th, which is the third Tuesday in June when a lot of people go on vacation because school's out and I don't expect this turnout to be very good at all. Uh, more people need to get involved, and I don't know. I don't know the mindset of of everyone out there, but I, you know a lot of people say, "Well, my vote really doesn't count." We need to do a better job of educating people that your vote does count, and especially in an election like this, it definitely counts. Um, you know, would love to see it. You know, the elections for the city council may be moved into you know, a, a different cycle, but uh, I, I don't, you know, I, I think it's just time. Alrighty, um, Ms. Parkshaw. Yeah, the low voter turnout is uh, somewhat of a, 
I, I won't say a mystery, but it's uh, frustrating for me. Uh, and I think the reason is that people don't recognize uh, how important the, the local elections are. Uh, and, you know, people, they vote for the president, but they don't realize that it's their city council members that make sure that their potholes are filled, that the trash gets picked up, uh, that their parks, you know, are, are safe and that they're not, their neighborhoods are thriving. And so I think uh, the offering education to the public about the importance of what their vote can do for them, um, I think is important. I think also uh, educating them that, you know, it is possible to lose a race by one vote. Uh, in a local election that many times I think people get uh, confused about the electorate and, you know, all that happens at the national level at the in, in the presidential races, but they don't recognize that in their local elections. Uh, I also think that the timing of it also is, is an issue as well. Um, as uh, Dan Tarwater mentioned, I think uh, maybe looking at a different cycle may be, be beneficial, but I think you know, people are frustrated. They feel like their voice isn't heard. So the more folks that we elect uh, that will listen to the, the community that are going to co-govern or, or work with them, I think um, the better off that we will be because then they know that their voice is heard and that their voices matter, um, which is why I try to, to be, an, I am an, a person who prioritize the voice of the people that have put me in office. Thank you. All right, Ms. Hall. No, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Robinson, you were back. Okay. But Ms. Hall, we'll, we'll come to you, Ms. Roberts. Just trying okay. to give you time. Sure, thank you so much. Um, I agree with what's been said. I also believe that the city needs to invest in publicizing the election. We do not, we put a, um, invest in actual um, making sure that the election is functioning, but making sure that people are aware uh, that there is an election is something that the city has not adequately invested in. And so I would add that um, to the list. Um, as well as um, really democratizing uh, local, um, not only elections, but local governance. When you have a lot of our meetings that are at times when people can't access them, then it's a direct reflection of their participation. If they haven't been participating for four years, what makes you think that they're just going to automatically oh, say, oh, well, I need to go participate? No, we need to make sure that our budget is being voted on at a time where people can engage, that we're having public hearings around things that matter to people at different times. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't rush through a lot of the things that we do rush through. Like, for example, we've gotten a lot of heat about our city charter and rushing through that process. Those are some things that we should really slow down and make sure we're engaging people. And it's why I push through a policy to make sure that public engagement becomes a policy of the city that is codified in, our, in the way that we govern. And I think if people are involved throughout the years, then they will be more involved on election day. Ms. Hall, we'll go to you. So from what I'm seeing, the problem with the low voter turnout, um, number one is apathy. If we have a city that, again, is traumatized, that um, is seeing the re more results from violence than they do from elected officials, um, they continue to stay close to the rivers and the lakes that they're used to, so to speak, right? Um, we have to begin to change that narrative. Um, I do agree with the timing, but not so much in that what time of year it is. Like even this election was actually moved um, from a time that used to previously be held. Um, but with regards to giving people and letting people know their options, now there are multiple modalities into the way that you can vote. Um, we have, you know, excuse-free absentee voting. We have all of those things available to people. Like that's already started now. So people can actually start voting now. Um, but a lot of people do not know that these things are on the table. They don't know these things exist. Um, and if we're able to make uh, no excuse absentee voting where people are able to come through this time all the way up to election day and vote and do what they need to do without having to take a whole day or a half day or wait in this long line to go vote, there's absolutely no reason that we can't make um, the rest of the workings of government this way so that people can begin to see the results from elections, from um, politics and things of that nature, rather than seeing more results in violence. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. 
uh, Councilwoman Robinson uh, took my answer. Uh, I have nothing more to say. No, uh, I actually I agree with everything she had to say. Um, absolutely. When 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 the populace, when our residents don't feel like their city government wants to hear them, um, when you set a committee meeting or an opportunity for public comment in the middle of the day, you have to drive to city hall, pay for parking, um, take off work, and then maybe maybe your ordinance um, is heard that day, or maybe it's held um, until the next week. Um, it's happened um, as a community organizer, it happens to us a lot. Um, and it's frustrating and you can feel disenfranchised and you can feel like your government's not working with you, but is actually working against you. And so then why, why are you gonna wanna participate in that? Um, additionally, I also agree, I think it was Councilwoman Park Shaw stated um, that we need to do a better, better job of marketing these elections. We need to be marketing these elections and their importance along with civic engagement and civic education, the same way that we market the World Cup. Um, we, we need to be advertising and, and letting people know exactly uh, who city council members are, what their role, uh, role is in their everyday life. I can't tell you, we knocked 2,000 doors in the primary, we've knocked two, over 2,000 doors in the general, and so often I hear, there's an election? Well, you're an in-district city council candidate? Well, what does that mean? Uh, well, where, where are the boundaries of my district? How many districts are there? These are simple questions that I think that the city has an opportunity and an obligation to educate the public on. Um, so, you know, investing in public education and civic engagement and publicizing these elections the same way that we publicize the NFL draft or the World Cup, I think would go a long way to increase public engagement. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Um, I just want to get to this last question. I will have to leave you guys in a moment as I have an early morning. Um, but I wanted to end all, I wanted to get as many questions in as possible. Uh, so this last question, I'm going to go in alphabetical order according to last name. So this question is, what question do you wish I had asked you and how would you answer it? So we'll start with you, Mr. Duncan. Well, since this is the last question, let me reintroduce myself. Jonathan Duncan running to rep, uh, represent uh, Kansas City in the sixth in district. Um, well, I think that uh, the question that I would ask is, uh, why, right, why am I the best? Um, why am I the best uh, candidate for for city council in this district? Um, I'm a community organizer. I'm a, I'm a leader and organizer with Casey Tenants. I know what it's like to organize with my neighbors to improve our quality of life. Um, I've been doing it uh, and organizing for the last 15 years, the last three years with Casey Tenants. Um, as a community organizer, I know how to meet people where they are, um, which means that we've been knocking doors. We knocked, as I said before, 2,000 doors in the primary. Our goal is to knock 5,000 doors in the general. We are well on our way. I know how to coalition build um, and work with people um, who ideologically I might not agree with. But when we're working towards a common goal, uh, we can find paths um, to success because you know, the first the first rule of organizing is to identify um, what our self interest is in this work. Um, so I'm looking forward to um, working with the new city council members. Um, by the way, you know, we're looking at um, about half um, who are, we're going to turn over um, and and really talking with them, having one on ones with them, and asking them what is your self interest in this work, so that we can find where we're aligned to craft policy solutions um, that raise our quality of life here in Kansas City. Um, Jonathan Duncan running for city council in the 6th and district, community organizer, combat veteran, I'm ready uh, to start working um, to make Kansas City our home. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna clarify this. You you might have to repeat that because this is the last question from me, but you oh! will still have... <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So you will still have your two minute closing, but after these questions, I will leave, but you still will have your two minute closing. So let me clarify that. That's my, that's my error, I apologize, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> so you just can give it all over again. All right. <laughs> uh, Ms. Hall, to you now. <laughs> um, so I don't know that I had a question maybe that I wish you had asked, um, but I can give clarity. Um, we didn't necessarily talk about health care and mental health, and I'm a whole mental health advocate. Um, so with regards to that, um, and access to care, I would say, how do we increase access to care would be the question I wish you had asked. And my answer to that is by offering and funding clinical and non-clinical options that also are offered during multiple times of the day and multiple modalities. We also need to increase the city's involvement with the 988 
uh, suicide hotline as well. Um, as I said before, I approach mental health from a non-clinical and also social determinant stand. So your social determinants are your housing, your job, the way you feel in your community, violence, different things like that. Those are your social determinants of health. And there are also racial determinants of health. Um, also, if we went across the city and looked per zip code, we would see um, life expectancy differentials all over the city per zip code. There's many ways to look at this. And by looking at that, looking at the zip codes, looking at those social determinants, looking at those racial determinants and being able to um, put together offerings, working with people who have lived experience as to what we can do to help people feel better in their minds, their bodies and in this city, um, I think we will begin to make a dent in trauma and in violence. All right, thank you. Ms. Parkshaw. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to uh, thank you for um, doing such an, a fabulous job as moderators tonight. And, and I look forward to watching you uh, again, every, <laughs> as I do every morning on the news. Uh, but I might my, be a uh, tired, but okay. <laughs> yeah, you'll be yawning a little bit extra tomorrow. Uh, but I um, definitely, it, it's important to me. I, I think the question I would would have hoped you would have asked is why do I want to continue to serve? Mm. Uh, and it's important to me to just express as a as a proud 33 year member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, uh, I am, have a heart to serve as we serve uh, provide service to all mankind. Uh, as evidenced by all the work that I've done in my first term. From, you know, I talked about the houselessness. I serve on the Finance um, Public Safety Committee, the House Housing Policy Committee, uh, just recently uh, appointed as the chair of the Land Bank. I serve as the co chair of the Health Commission. I serve as the vice chair of the TIP Commission. And on, I don't know, probably another nine different organizations or organizational boards uh, because my commitment is to be of service to the residents of Kansas City. Uh, and so I am, it's, I consider it an honor to have served the first four years and without an opponent am just excited about having another four years of service. So thank you so much again and I uh, wish you a, a good night's rest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Um, I think I would have um, asked for a, a two-part question. One is, what's the mechanics of actually getting things done at City Hall? And mm -hmm. how have you measured uh, success using those mechanics? Uh, mm -hmm. I have worked in the nonprofit arena for almost 30 years now uh, for a healthcare organization as well as the ad hoc group against crime. And so I am firmly familiar with programs. Uh, the city government is not a program. The city government, our mechanics of getting thing done, things done is one, working with people to understand that what their needs are. We don't represent our own interests. We don't represent our experiences. We represent what it is that people need in order for them to live their best life. And so because we're a democratic republic, we have to depend on the people and engaging people in those policies and ideas. And the mechanics of getting those done starts with those good policies that are people-centered, but then also having relationships with the people that you work with and being able to get to seven votes to get things done. I've passed over 100 policies at the city, improving the quality of life and working with my colleagues and working with people to make sure that we're actually able to bring home the bacon or the squash, whatever you prefer. But um, <laughs> it's so very important um, that we understand those mechanics because if not, then we're left out of, of, of getting what we, what, what we need. All right, thank you. Last but not least, Mr. Tarwater. Well, I think what a lot of people are uh, looking at right now is downtown baseball. What is going to happen there? How is it going to happen? How is that going to work out for the people? And I, you know, there, it, it's going to be a vote of the people. They're going to make that decision, but I think that we need to be very careful that while we're working with the, uh, you know, with the owners of the team because it looks like it would displace a lot of people. It's gonna cause some property tax issues for other people that live around that area. We need to make sure that it has good paying jobs, it needs to make sure that the people you know, are, that will work there uh, get the fair living wage, but also can get there. You know, so the public transportation is gonna to need to be beefed up. Also, 
if it's put in East Village, what is going to happen to the taxpayer subsidized power and light district that's subsidized to the tune of about $20 million a year? And you put a new shiny object over in East Village, uh, does it kill power and light, which is going to hurt the voters you know, and hurt the citizens of Kansas City? There's a lot of things to look at before that vote happens. And when it does, I'm not even sure if it will pass. But uh, as Quentin Lucas said, uh, Mayor Lucas said, uh, at a forum I was at, it's sometimes rich people get what rich people want. In this case, I don't think that's necessarily a good idea. It needs to be vetted because once that thing is built, it's going to be sold back to the county for a dollar. And then there's going to be no property taxes paid on a billion dollar, two billion dollar uh, investment in that area. So we need to be careful. Is it going to go down? Down probably will, but it needs to be done correctly. All right. Thank you so much. I thank each of you for allowing me to serve as your moderator this evening. Um, I wish you all the best of luck in the upcoming election. And again, thank you so much to uh, the League of Women Voters for allowing me to moderate tonight. I will leave you with Ms. Anitra Steele, who will give you your last two minutes of closing. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank, thank you, Ms. You. Bell. All right. Thank you, Christelle. Uh, you now get to make your uh, two minute closing statements. Um, I think we will go in reverse alphabetical order since she started that in alphabetical order, which as a retired librarian is of course the right way to do things. So uh, we will start with Mr. Tarwater. Okay, number one, thank you very much for, for having us all tonight. It's, it's very important for the general public and, and uh, you know, people in the 6th District, the people in Kansas City, to understand who's running for office and what their, what their visions are. I love Kansas City, born and raised here, always lived in the 6th District, have served in the 6th District, and always been available, always had an open door, answered the, answered the phone, returned phone calls, have meetings at neighborhoods, transparent government is what everybody deserves. So I am looking forward to working with the city, working with six other people to make sure that we have the seven votes so that we can move the city forward. And very excited to see Kansas City, you know, the growth that we have, you know, starting with the NFL draft and then going to the World Cup. These are big events for Kansas City to put us on the world stage which will help us gain other businesses, gain our tax base, help our small businesses grow because that is the economic engine of Kansas City. So I love Kansas City. That's why I'm running. That's why I have served in the past and I'm here to help other people. So thank you very much. Remember Dan Tarwater on June 20th for the 6th District. Thank you very much again for, uh, for the forum. Um, thank you everyone for uh, your attention today, especially want to thank the legal Whitman voters and the sponsors for collaborating and coming together to make this happen and make sure that we're um, sharing these messages with um, the public. I uh, want to offer not only to ask for your vote, humbly ask for your vote to continue to serve the residents of the third district, but I would encourage you to come volunteer. Um, you can reach me at melissarobinson.org, M-E-L-I-S-S-A dot R-O, I'm sorry, M-E-L-I-S-S-A-R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N dot O-R-G. I was getting ready to give my email, but we would encourage you to uh, be engaged uh, with the campaign, uh, stand with us at the grocery store, to encourage people to get out and to vote. They would love to see uh, your bright, smiling faces. Um, but we, I, I want to people to vote for me because of the passion that I have for the third district. The third district is the heart of the city. If we invest in the heart of the city, if we reverse the historic displacement that the third district has endured for decades upon decades upon decades, then our city will be stronger. We will improve our GDP um, and we will be able to address the number one issue that people have in this city is crime and violence. And how do we address that is by giving, making sure that people have opportunity. Um, the root causes of crime and violence as has been stated here has to do with poverty and people's social economic status. 
um, the city does have ways that we can invest strongly in making sure that we're removing blight, that we're creating home ownership, that tenants continue to have strong rights and protections, um, that we are, we are creating policies that are crafted in what people are experiencing and not what other what we want other people to say about us, but what are our residents saying about us? And that's what we have to put first at City Hall. And I wanna go back for the next four years to fight, to continue to fight for you and with you. Thank you. Ms. Parkshaw. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank uh, the League of Women Voters uh, and all of the uh, partners that uh, put this on tonight. Again, wanna thank Christelle Bell for moderating. Uh, as the uh, incumbent and without an opponent, uh, I am in entirely grateful, eternally grateful for the opportunity to be able to continue to serve, um, serve the residents. I have spent my last four years really trying to be a voice for the people, being someone who attends the neighborhood meetings, uh, it, it, pretty much all of them, whether whether I'm officially invited or not, uh, you will see me throughout the city and I, you will continue to see me working hard for the people, trying to create policy that comes forward to me that will, will help make our neighborhood stronger, help our neighborhoods to thrive and help the individuals of Kansas City who really make Kansas City work and be what it is to to move forward. So I, I thank you for your attention tonight. Thank you for um, your the uh, for the opportunity to be able to serve. And I want to steal one from Melissa Robinson's book and, and ask you also to, to consider volunteering um, as I'm also out knocking doors. Uh, even though I don't have an opponent, it's important to me to understand what, what the people want us and city council to do for them. So you can reach me at raynaparkshaw.com. It's R-Y-A-N-A. P A R K S S H A W dot com. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Hall. Thank you so much. Um, I do also want to thank the League of Women Voters, um, as well as all the sponsors for having us. Um, it, it is not an easy feat to pull together these type of occurrences and actually really get people involved. Um, in, in civic discourse. So hats off to League of Women Voters. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, why am I running? Um, I've grown up in the third district. I've always been in the third district. I am a person who has, if, if you know anything about third district, I've survived and not just survived third district, I am starting to really live. And I want to see the third district live as well as Kansas City. I want to see us live, not just survive, not just exist, but live, thrive, and really enjoy the city that we have. We have an absolutely beautiful city. We have absolutely beautiful services, amenities, and things here that most of us don't even know exist. And it's because we are grinding day in, day out, trying to make what we can to do what we can to make a lot for ourselves here. And it just should not be that. I definitely believe in more workforce housing, more affordable housing, more and multiple pathways to housing and home ownership. I believe the city should be investing in small businesses as at least 70 percent of our residents are employed by small business. Um, and we just, we simply don't have enough investment. Further, we have disinvestment in the city, especially in the third district. And I want to see that reversed. I want to see the violence reversed. And yes, it is beautiful to do things at a policy level, but doing things at the policy level and also backing them up with implementation and pulling together stakeholders and organizations to make things happen is really important. Um, I believe I am that candidate. So if you want to know more about me, purposeforkc.com. And finally, Mr. Duncan. Yes, thank you all for having me this evening. Um, my name is Jonathan Duncan. I'm running to represent you in the City Council 6th in District. Uh, I'm a combat veteran. I'm a community organizer with the Citywide Tenant Union, KC Tenants, and I'm the Director of Operations for the National VFW Headquarters. Um, I joined the Army at 17, um, and my community saved my life. Um, first, when I was overseas, and when I came home at 21 with, with PTSD, and the mental health care services that I was promised weren't there. 
Um, I've been working alongside my community to build a Kansas City where we can thrive, not just survive, a Kansas City that works for everyone. Um, I think this election is important because our values are on the ballot. Um, and I think it's important that I name uh, my opponent, Dan Tarwater, um, who does not reflect the values of the 6th District. Um, I often say I'm the only candidate in this race who is pro-choice, pro-LGBTQ rights, and pro-common sense gun control because my opponent, um, while on the Jackson County Legislature, either fought against or voted against each of those um, during the last 30 years. Um, in 2021, uh, Mr. Tarwater sided with the state when they chose to protect guns over our kids by no longer enforcing federal gun laws. In 2022, he voted against a woman's right to choose. And just six months ago, he was organizing against the conversion therapy ban and the chair of the LGBTQ commission called Mr. Tarwater out by name as being the reason Jackson County failed to do the right thing sooner. Uh, they had to wait until Mr. Tarwater left uh, before they could do the right thing and ban conversion therapy at the county level. I don't think Kansas City has time to wait. If you support a woman's right to choose, if you support LGBTQ rights, if you support common sense gun control, um, that I'm a candidate for you. Uh, vote Jonathan Duncan on June 20th. Um, thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank you, candidates. This has been a very, very informative forum. Uh, thank you, audience, for your thought-provoking questions and your interest in the June 20th Kansas City Municipal Election. And we also want to thank our guest moderator, Christelle Bell, for staying up past her bedtime so that she could moderate this forum. A recording of this forum will be available on the League's website, lwvkc.org. So you can send that to your mother-in-law so they can see how well you've done. Um, Please take a moment to share our candidate forums via your Facebook page, Nextdoor, and other favorite social media channels. And remember, for complete candidate and voting information, visit lwvkc.org and vote411.org. Uh, this forum will be linked to your information on Vote411. Thank you. Good night.